Uh, first of all, can all you way up and back there, Mr. Willis, can you hear me? You can, Karen, you good, Allison? All right, unfortunately you can, huh? Sorry. Good morning all, and thanks to Mr. Packard who invited me to speak this morning. So you can blame him if my talk becomes unbearable or corny, or thank him if it allows you to catch up on some sleep. Either way, I am 100% sure that the words that you hear here are more important than any other thing and that nothing else that you might experience today would even partially eclipse them. <laughs> Low hanging fruit. As an aside, I just have to mention one thing that in addition to being a tree and grounds person, I'm the old guy who drives the plow truck on campus. On those snowy mornings as you eagerly set off for breakfast towards the school building and the plow truck quietly comes up behind you, I'm not trying to push you out of the way or scare the heck out of you. I'm just trying to keep your stylish footwear from getting slush all over them, so, okay? I've been at, on the Brooks campus for almost 33 years now, and I've seen many changes in those three plus decades. I am a tree lover, and nothing makes me happier than to see them in their seasons of glory, whether it be the early flowering yellow witch hazel outside the back of the Packard's residence, the white star magnolia in front of Merriman, the bright pink cherry trees now in bloom by the faculty houses, or the fall colors of the many red maples all over campus. On the flip side, nothing makes me sadder than to see trees lost for one reason or another. As I speak today, we're losing one large beech tree that was planted 76 years ago in front of Thornhouse on April 6, 1948. Recent storms have ravaged the tree and the latest snow tore a major limb from it, changing its status from prime specimen to a war-torn hazard. It was difficult to admit that the tree had to go, but two experts concurred, and it was determined that the tree would need removal. A real bummer, to say the least. About 30 years ago, we came across old notes regarding specific trees on campus from a former teacher by the name of Oscar Root. Mr. Root was a science teacher, and he enjoyed a specific interest in the trees that had been planted by the Russell family, who, by the way, donated the land that became Brooks School way back in the 1920s. From Mr. Root's notes, we were able to identify specific trees of interest here, and since then, have assembled a map of some 170 different species at Brooks. In addition, we have amassed data re regarding tree varieties numbers of trees and the relative ages and health of them. The map we created shows some 965 individual trees within Campus Central. And of them, 415 have been planted within the last 20 years, which I believe is good news for the future of the Brooks tree population. For you scientists out there, I am certain that the term biodiversity is well known and the importance of it. Having many varieties of trees on campus creates a healthier environment in comparison from one that only has a few types. While you move about campus, you might not immediately spot the difference between a red oak, a red pine, a red maple, or a pin oak. Many will only see that they are both green trees and move on to math class. However, the small or not so small differences between them may spell the difference between one being susceptible to an insect or disease while the other is immune. In addition, specific varieties of animals prefer, if not require, certain trees to either provide food or shelter. So by providing many diverse varieties of trees also helps to create homes for diverse animals as well. As late as the 1960s, Brooks had a large number of elm trees on campus. They were beautiful, umbrella-shaped specimens, some as tall and wide as 100 feet, and providing cool shade during hot summer months. However, a disease called Dutch elm eventually wiped out all but one. It resides up by the mute, the mute uh, Musto hut, uh, house across the road, uh, right up by where Russell used to be. 
Baltimore Orioles, a beautiful orange and black songbird, loved to nest in their hanging branches, and the loss of the elms resulted in a lowering of the population of Orioles in our area. Thankfully, the Orioles have learned to use other tree varieties and have made a comeback. Currently, we have about a dozen Sergeant Cherry trees on campus. One is just outside of the chapel right over here. Flocks of cedar waxwings, a beautiful mask song, songbird, love to feed in the blossoms soon to come out within the next week or two, weather permitting. And later, the very sour, tiny cherries in late May. We experienced a feeding frenzy one late spring day of the somewhat ripened cherries under one of these trees behind what is now the Packard's residence. It was quite sunny, and yet it seemed that it was raining raining tiny cherry pits on our heads. Mr. Burgess, then the school's bird guru, explained that the birds were very efficient at, well, processing the cherries, and in nine seconds, he claimed, would eat it, process it, and, well, expel it the pit from the other end of its digestive system. We moved away from the tree. How Mr. Burgess knew about the nine seconds is beyond me, but young students, please take note. This might be some of the stuff you learn in college if you decide to study birds. This is why I studied trees. In case if you haven't noticed recently, Mother Nature has a habit of changing things, like the weather, for example. And since certain trees are flexible and others not so much, it is wise to have many different types. Last spring, as an example, we had a very late and cold frost, meaning the temperature dipped below freezing suddenly, and as a result, many trees and shrubs in bloom were damaged. One, a shrub called Forsythia, lost its bright yellow blossoms. A second, local peach trees, had their blossoms severely damaged. While the loss of the Forsythia blooms was a bummer, the local peach blossoms meant the loss of them meant that there would be no locally grown peaches to be found in New England, a huge economic loss to the orchard growers. Now, had they grown only peaches, their entire income would have been lost. Thankfully, most all grew apples, pears, and other things which flowered later and were unaffected by the frost and allowed the orchardists sufficient income for the year. In my time here, I've enjoyed the opportunity to plant quite a few trees, some of still which flourish, and some that didn't quite make it. We have lost some to animals, in particular four to a buck, that's a male deer for the uninitiated, that liked to mark his territory by scraping the bark off young specimens, and recently at least one to a ravenous beaver where the old Lyman boathouse used to be. Check it out if you have a chance. It looks like a sharpened pencil behind the new stone wall to the left of the Demoulis boathouse. Some that we received from the National Arbor Day Foundation in 1992, you all can recall that year, right? All in a single envelope about a foot long, now stand over 30 feet tall. Others, like some of the aforementioned Sergeant Cherries, we dug out of the woods and saw them flourish by the chapel and the het garages. So, if you haven't fallen asleep by now, I hope that you now know how I feel about trees on our Brooks campus. Yes, I'm a tree hugger, but there's one tree on campus that I advise you not to hug if you feel so inclined. If you're familiar with the little six-sided building over in front of the gym that used to serve as the guard shed, but now is the drop-off point for all you gourmet foodies, there is a large honey locust tree behind it that bears gigantic thorns along its trunk. I'll wager that you have very likely passed by it but never noticed its thorny disposure. While your busy time focusing on your upcoming SATs, college prospects, or the lacrosse match, take a minute to notice the trees. Hopefully, the upcoming spring flower show should be quite good. Thank you for your time. <laughs>